What's up everybody? Welcome back to FNG Academy. I just had a quick announcement. I'm proud to say that we've been helping people get selected for three years now. I've been getting a lot of messages about uh, people thanking us and saying that they just graduated from uh, selection and they got selected. Uh, people graduating the Q course. Uh, one of my buddies just sent me a video uh, from the Charlie committee. He asked, if you guys have ever heard of the FNG Academy, raise your hands. And all their hands went up and it just filled me with pride. Um, so part of the way that we do that is making sure that you guys are physically fit and ready for selection. And the way we've been doing that for the past couple years is by sending you to a Green Beret we know and trust, Kevin over at 18 Alpha Fitness. So if you want to get selected, you need to be in the best shape possible and you need a programmer who knows what they're talking about. So go check out Kevin over at 18 Alpha Fitness. Use code word BUCK to get a discount. Tell him we sent you and hook you up. Congrats to everyone who's been getting selected lately and we'll see you guys on the next one. What's up guys? Welcome to this episode of Beers and Breakdowns. In this episode, we have a very special movie for you today. It's very special for us as former Green Berets. This is something that's a big deal. It's a really big deal, actually, to have a good Green Beret movie come out. Dude, finally, right? Finally. Well, how many times have we done these in all these military movies? Just a lot of them are SEAL movies, a lot of them are whatever, but we've had a couple Green Beret movies, and none of them have been good. None of them have been good. Finally, we get a good movie. Yes, and this one passes the test. I'm going to be... Uh, I'll play devil's advocate for like a hot second. And it only takes a hot second because I don't care that much. Is it reminiscent of Lone Survivor? Yes. Right. There's obviously a lot of similarities to Lone Survivor. Uh, the fact that he's the lone survivor in this. Right. And besides his terp. But they really pulled away from Lone Survivor with having him go through and then have to go back and and, and rescue the terp. Yeah. So I just, I love this movie. I thought it was so dope and it was so good. There were some inconsistencies. That, we'll just talk about them in the beginning. Is that right, Abel? Let's just, we'll just talk about the inconsistencies. It was like one of them that was kind of weird was all his patches. So mm-hmm. like we were talking about is he's the team sergeant, right? Because he's in charge seemingly, of his team, yeah. seemingly, but he wears a patch that says uh, Bravo 1. So if you guys don't know that in the team order, the pecking order, your, your team sergeant's a Zulu. So you got your Zulu, and then you have Bravo 1. You have all your seniors. So you have uh, your Bravo 1, your Echo 1, your Charlie 1, your Delta 1. And these are all your MOSs, 18 yeah. Zulu, 18 Bravo, Charlie, Delta, and so on. Yeah, so he's wearing a patch that says JTAC, Bravo 1, and clearly he's the team sergeant just by his position on the team and his authority on the team. Um, so it, it, that was the only kind of weird thing. Yeah. Which it's fine because if you want to wear a Bravo, can be JTAC qualified, so it can make sense that you would have Bravo One JTAC, and then also can it make sense that he's a team sergeant? Yes. Let's say uh, he was Bravo One, and then right before deployment, his team sergeant got killed, got uh, redeployed, um, had to get off the team for whatever reason. Now he becomes the team sergeant. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so instead of replacing his patch with Zulu One. He stays Bravo One just because it's semantics, and he doesn't want his guys to think he's on a power trip. Yeah. So it's easily explainable why he's Bravo One JTAC. Um, so if you guys watch this, don't think that they just screwed it up. I don't think most Green Berets would wear a JTAC identifier. Yeah. yeah. Um, but no big deal. I think it fits perfectly fine. Great movie. Yeah. I love this movie. Another thing I really like is that Jake Gyllenhaal didn't try to be an SF guy. Right, yeah. He yeah. just picked a character. And on SF teams, you have the weird guy. Mm-hmm. You have the macho man. You you have a ton of different personalities. It's very authentic. Like, he didn't yeah. come in like a, a Chris Pratt. Like, right. I'm you know, macho man. Yeah. I'm the Green Beret. I'm the Zulu. Yeah, exactly. He didn't try too hard. Like, yeah, he, he didn't he try. He did what he had to do. He like, picked like a really just, odd kind of thing yeah, where yeah. he's kind of monotone. <clears throat> he jokes a little bit. He's like, well, uh, and it, w- it was super authentic. I felt like he was just another guy on the team. Yeah, for sure. I mean, look at you. You're a comedian. You're funny. You're super positive. <laughs> you're never trying to be that, like, mochismo guy. Yeah. That's it. And you're Green Bray. You're used to, my Delta used to always tell me I was the less, the most, what do you say, the least military guy on the team. It's like, I appreciate that. Yeah, that's <laughs> a, a compliment. 
in the military because the most military guy is kind of a douchey thing, right? Yeah. You got the high and tight. You're very by the book. You, you use a lot of lingo. Um, and it's annoying. So the fact that he just chose a normal personality to be yeah. was really cool and really fitting for this movie. Yeah, I liked it. Loved it. So let's get into it. We'll stop and chatting before we even see the scenes. Um, and let's dive into probably one of the best Green Beret movies in decades. And I want to say in decades because I want to be careful because we still haven't reviewed John Wayne, the Green Beret. <laughs> the original the the OG. OG <laughs> what started it all for us. So let's jump in without further ado. Is there a problem here? <laughs> Watching the movie, Eddie. Eddie. Ciao, ciao. Eddie's ready. Tom? Don't talk to me. Talk to John. <laughs> I don't know. He's scared. Ciao, ciao. All right, so the one thing I wanted to hit on here was actually the call signs, which we just talked about a little bit. So one thing that's pretty cool about this movie for me is I was actually on 3-3. So like, oh, are you serious? Yeah, that so was your that team guy number? was wearing oh, the 3-3 yeah. Charlie 2. That was my team. Bro. Oh, that's dope, dude. So what's awesome, yeah. and what a lot of people might not know, especially if you're not in the military or SF, is the way they designate the teams, right? Right now we have a four-digit team number. It used to be three back in the day, but now it's four digits. So, for instance, my team was 12-33, 1, 2, 3, 3. And so our patches said 3-3, three, three, Charlie 2 for mine. Um, so the way you break that down is the first number is your group. So I was in first group, so first number is a one. The second digit on your number is your company. Uh, or I'm sorry, your battalion. Battalion, So I was in team. second battalion. So one, first group, two, second battalion. The third is your company. So I was in Charlie company, so Alpha, Bravo, Charlie. So that was my three. And then for us in first group, the third team was your mountain team. So I was on the third team, so it was a mountain team. By the first three numbers, you could tell a lot. You can mm -hmm. tell which group, which battalion, and which company they come from. So that's just something that a lot of people probably don't know if they're yeah. not in the know. The one thing that bothers me about the uniform, it's really funny because Jake Gyllenhaal wore the exact same boots I wore in Afghanistan. The only thing that bothers me about their uniform is their helmets. So clearly they wanted the most comfort for the, mm -hmm. um, the actors, so they went with bump helmets. And bump helmets, if you guys don't know, they're, they're not bulletproof. They're, uh, they're meant for like... You know, getting bumps on your head, like you rocks do falling jumps, and things like that. Yeah, so uh, mountain mountaineers climbing. use them. Halo operations, they use mountain, uh, bump helmets. So they're just to make sure, like, if you hit a knock, it's not going to hit you. It's in a the, glorified bicycle helmet. Exactly. It's a glorified bicycle helmet. But it's very obvious the difference between a bump, bump helmet and um, a ballistic helmet. Yeah. And so that's the only thing I have an issue with is they have these all tan bump helmets. And it's like, come on. Does he just go that one little extra yeah. and paint it? Yeah, we all painted our helmets. All of us painted our helmets. And the, the thing is, it's really important because teams before you painted that helmet, somebody mm -hmm. before that team painted that helmet. Yeah. So you're getting this helmet like passed down over and over from SF guy to SF guy. <laughs> it's been changed so many times. It never is just this basic clean tan. You rarely have a brand new helmet right, like that. Right, rarely have a brand new helmet and it's always going to have some kind of paint on it or some kind of customization that that person did or people did for their mission yeah. set. So the helmet is the only thing that's throwing me off. It's kind of cringy because it's so clean and neat, but that's super nitpicky. Yeah, for sure. To Jack Jack. To Jack Jack. When do you think Steve should get his first beer? I don't know. When do you get to drink your first beer, Steve? Well, whenever you say so, sir. Bon appetit. Merci, mon général. To the boots I hope to fill, boys. Uh, it's one of the only few scenes that bothers me. Really? Yeah, it bothers me because it's like, all right, Jake Gyllenhaal did an amazing job, like, not being a douchebag. And the, the obviously the senior on the team is like confirming with the team sergeant, like, hey, when does he get a drink of beer? It's like, mm -hmm. we're kind of just throwing it out there for him. Jake Gyllenhaal, totally cool. Throw, gives him the nod, throws him a beer. And he tries to give a speech, like, shut the <laughs> You just, you literally <laughs> just got authorized to drink a beer as a new guy. And you're going to give a speech <laughs> to the boots I hope to fill. Shut the f Nobody f 
to ask you <laughs> to about the boots you're trying to fill. Just be happy you got oh, a beer. That's funny. You know, that reminds me of being the new guy in the team room and having a stock the refrigerator. And oh, the first so time, expensive, dude. Right, so stock the refrigerator beer. But the first time, the whole team cracked the beer in the team room and being like, I don't know if I can have one. Yeah. And like, because as the new guy, like, yeah. I'm not just going to crack a beer and sit down. So I had to, I, I can't remember when exactly it happened, but eventually my senior was like, hey, Kurt, you want a beer? Hell yeah. And then I was like, all right, it's cool for me yep, to have a beer. Because exactly. you don't want to just assume. Right. Because you don't want to overstep your bounds as a new guy, especially a new guy right here showing up under these circumstances. That's yeah. going to be tough to, to earn that trust. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're you're already in a combat zone, so you're once you take combat, you, like it'll fast track your new guy time big time. Yeah. But it was really cool. He got the ominous dominus to drink a beer. I just bothered me that he's like, to the boots I hope to fill, boys. <laughs> if you guys don't know, speeches are for seniors. <laughs> like, it, you know what I'm saying? Like speeches for you on the inside. You don't give speeches when you're still on the outside as a new guy. I'll say. Giving a speech as a new guy, you're taking a risk. <laughs> okay. It better it better yeah. be the right time and place. Because yeah. if it's not, and you're going to get dragged to the mud. it better be well received. <laughs> yeah, or you're right. They're going to lynch uh, you to the horses yep. and go taking off running. That's like taking a three-point shot. You better hope you make yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So that, that speech in the whole, like, mon general to me, I would have roasted his ass. <laughs> I would probably... Yeah, I would, give me that beer back. <laughs> yeah, I would like, give me the beer. Go, 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 go. So, cheese. What's the you? <laughs> the god is. <laughs> <laughs> I missed it the first time I watched this. What? I missed the throwing the American flag over his shoulder and the say <laughs> cheese. Because now they use that picture against them. They send that picture to the online. Tagged the Taliban in it, and now it's like he's a snitch. Yeah. So whether he snitches or not, Got we're him. gonna we own him because we're gonna tag him as a snitch, <laughs> and he's gonna get killed. Got his. So I, but I, I just wanted to talk about like the the wheelhouse that they're in right now, because this is not SF wheelhouse. Just so you guys know, this is not what we're authorized to do. So clearly, they're going kind of a little rogue. Mm -hmm. And I'm not even going to say that no that SF guys don't do this. But what you guys need to understand is that not everything we do is what we're supposed to do. Yeah. And that's perfectly fine. That's the, the point of SF, really. Like, you have to be flexible. Yeah. As long as you don't get caught. <laughs> yeah. If you get caught doing the shit you're not supposed to be doing, that's on you. They'll hang you out to dry. But you accept those risks. So has SF teams done stuff like this? Of course. Are they supposed to? Is it in our wheelhouse? Are we authorized? Most of the time, absolutely not. But because this is straight up like CIA. Yeah, and I mean the scene before this, you got to see how the the commander was basically like, "You do what you have to do. Mm -hmm. I don't want to know about it." Right. And so, kind of almost blessed off on it without officially blessing off on mm -hmm. it. So basically, as long as these guys, like you said, as long as they don't get caught, then he's allowed to do what he needs to do to accomplish his objective yeah it's results based and a lot yeah. a lot of the police department they always say that it's results based is you do what you got to do and if you get the results you want congratulations yeah. you did a great job but if you get caught doing this stuff outside the wheelhouse and it doesn't pan out well we're gonna have to hang you out because you're yeah. not within those like, borders i i didn't have anything to do yeah. with it i didn't know they're gonna do that i didn't know they're gonna go kidnap some <laughs> afghan and uh you know get information from them that way, oh, I would never authorize that. No right. commander would authorize that. So that's more like, I mean, that's got to be some tier one type stuff. I'm sure someone's doing that regularly uh, because obviously it's going to be effective. But I just think that's really cool. And they made it very clear. They weren't like being ridiculous about it. They made it very clear that everyone's like, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. And they're like, we're going to do that. And they're like, okay, here it is. Yeah. You know, this is like the movie explains it perfectly. Well, it, it, I like it because it shows, like, different methods. Like, you know it needs to be done to get the information, but once you put all these layers of bureaucracy and mm -hmm. military brass and everything on top of it, it muddles everything and it makes it much more difficult to accomplish your mission. Mm -hmm. 
It's like these guys just needed a couple hours. They got the information they needed. If they had went through the proper channels, it would have taken far longer, and it probably they probably wouldn't have got the same results. They would have never found the guy because no. he would have been gone. It would have been then. weeks later yeah. by the time it went up the chain, came back down, and right. all that. So this is a lot of this movie is bypassing the chain of command, and that's why I think the unit is always so small. Yeah. Because I, ideally, you don't ever want to operate the way that these guys are. You don't want to operate team solo, essentially. Mm. You want your command to be on board so that way you have uh, QRF, quick reaction force, waiting for you in case you get in a tick, troops in contact. You want to have air coverage overhead during your entire mission in case you get in a tick. You have immediate fire superiority um, so all these things you want in place, and that's the benefits of going through command and going through the proper channels. They'll make sure you have an Apache assigned to you, a C-130 gunship. Um, you'll know if you're down on an aircraft. You'll have a JTAC, something that they don't have with them. So you'll get all these assets. An EOD guy will get attached to you, so you can do route clearance. Well, technically, they do have a JTAC. Yeah. It's on his patch. <laughs> yeah, it's on his patch. The team sergeant. And the Bravo 1. He's, he's got so many hats. Yeah, Jake Gyllenhaal is like doing way too much. <laughs> but so because they're bypassing the chain of command, they're taking an ass load of risk. And it, they demonstrate that in the show. Yeah. There's nothing uh, strange about it. There's nothing that doesn't make sense. They it, make it make sense. I, that's one part I really like about this movie is because it shows... To both sides of that coin, right? Mm -hmm. Like they're able to assume that risk and operate in the gray and you see the awesome results that it produces. But then on the flip side later, you also see the downside. Yep. So that's not having cool. all the air coverage. It's not having all the assets that comes with an authorized mission. Yep. You're out of your bounds, Ahmed. You're here to translate. Actually, I'm here to interpret. All right, you want to be right, Ahmed? Hey, Chizzy, check the drone. On it. JJ, Tomcat. Go up to the top of those rocks there and tell me what you see. Viper 62, Viper 62, this is Havoc 33. Havoc 33, this is Viper 62. Roger, we need live imagery now. Viper, stop. The road is safe. What are we waiting for, John? I'm waiting to hear if there's an ambush up ahead. I'm not. I love this scene. Yeah, this scene's sick. When he asked for the drone, mm -hmm. can he always ask for the drone? And if he can, why wouldn't he always ask for the drone before they go into any area that, like, the final destination? Why is there no drone there before they get there anyway? That's all part of the planning in the buildup. And that's what I'm, if you had a planned operation that went through the chain of command, you would request a drone, they would get you a drone authorized, and you would have that drone overwatching your entire mission. Mm -hmm. But because they're not doing that, it's most likely that they don't have the drone authorized to them. And that's why they said, oh, I need 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. So there's a drone in the air all the time in Afghanistan somewhere. But now you're jumping on saying, hey, we need this drone. So you don't have it authorized to you for your mission because your mission wasn't approved and set aside all your assets. So now you're essentially borrowing assets from theater. Okay. So yeah. whatever's available. So they could say, hey, man, we're, we're 30 minutes out from you guys. And you're stuck dealing with that 30 minutes because you didn't want to go through the proper chains because your mission isn't uh, pre-approved. So they're kind of just hoping they even get the drone. There's no guarantee that they get the drone. You also got to consider, too, that there's only limited resources. Like, I think a lot of people think that there's just, like, drones everywhere and we have 100% coverage of the area, but it's not always like that. There's limited resources and there's different priorities. Well, we get told on a regular basis that we have the most powerful, most superior army on the planet. Right. So when you say something like that to civilians who've never even been anywhere near True. a base, we just assume that we have it all. Why can't all you the just time. make sure that these yeah. people stay alive? Like right. you can't send a drone? Like, but that's, yeah, that's, there's so many operations happening simultaneously mm -hmm. that it's like everyone has gone through the proper chains. Even like an infantry unit would never spontaneously make a mission and go out and do it. So they've gone through the proper chain. So they have a ton of assets assigned to them because they went through the proper chain. So they're pulling asinine amount of assets. So each operation is pulling asinine amount of assets. And then once a, there's a troops in contact, those assets then get reprioritized and repulled. So it's constantly just moving all over theater with depending on what's happening at that moment. Mm -hmm. So even if you have assets available to you and you're not in a contact, if somebody gets troops in contact near you, your assets will then get pulled to them be, to try and save lives. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's so fluid yeah. that even if you, know, you do it right and you have them all, you may not have them all because of something else going on in theater. 
But what I love about this scene was the way that Jake Gyllenhaal, he, he's like constantly in this like battle to maintain uh, authority with the ter- interpreter, but also not be stupid. Right, yeah, exactly. He's not trying to have a big contest, yeah. but he's also trying to let the interpreter know, like, you don't run this show. I'm in charge. I'm in charge, so, you know, understand that I'm in charge. Yeah. But I'm not going to be stupid and get my guys killed because of my ego. So I'm also going to check this out. Yep. you only getting so many of those as the interpreter. Yeah, yeah. If this didn't pan out, then yeah. he would have been he silenced. Would've, he would have been silenced because at that point, <clears throat> you, you know, it's like, all right, dude, just shut up. Because yeah. we have people like that all the time in Afghanistan. Interpreters always got, oh, I got intel, I got intel. And it doesn't pan out, doesn't pan out, doesn't pan out. And so it's like you have to start judging who's got reliable intel and who just wants to throw you off, who has a cousin that really doesn't know anything that's calling in bullshit. So I really like that they they made Jake Gyllenhaal like respectfully always like l- make smart decisions. Because yeah. what does it hurt to throw some guys up Right. Uh, on Overwatch, get the drone over, and just make sure. Yeah. And especially since they, you're not authorized to be there anyway, yeah, it's you too really easy. <laughs> don't want this to go south. So, amazing scene. I love this scene. I'll let you stay here. We don't need a translator for this. Jack's killer. That was sick. I love that scene. Damn, that was dope. <laughs> Dude, when he said, we don't need an interpreter for this, I was like, and My SF boner got so hard dude oh my god dude that scene is so sick yeah i love that they just identify that and then uh, the Look, best part is that jake gyllenhaal is just like we don't need an interpreter for this yeah, we're not talking we're not talking <laughs> no bullshit commands no go left check right clear clear yeah, clear right. they go in kill the enemy and then look at them and start making assessment yeah they could have kept clearing through but it looked like that was a wall true I mean, essentially, they just went in and started banging hammers. Banging hammers, son. <laughs> hey, what is it? Walks like a duck, quacks like a duck. <laughs> Time to f- bang hammers, son. You guys know what I'm talking about. You know what's up. Bang hammers, dude. Bang hammers. But I'm a Bravo, bro. I don't need to be fluent because I'm fluent with that trigger, son. <laughs> you don't need an interpreter. <laughs> we don't need an interpreter. Damn, this scene was dope as shit. Yep. I love it so much. God, this, I love this movie. Yeah, it was. It was. Um, I didn't even realize that there was a door on the other side of that. Me either. And it looked like a wall. I feel. I thought they were clear, um, but that's the thing is, you in Afghanistan and in these third world countries, like a lot of their houses are built with scrap metal and yeah. secret doors, and, like following code, like we follow here. Right. So you, know, it's not always obvious where there do- there's a door. So are they wrong for not checking it? Like, no, it didn't look like there was a door, and. They just found a, they said Jack Jack's killer. I'm assuming that's one of their teammates or the old interpreter that got killed. No, Jack Jack was the guy at the beginning scene that he went to check the back of the truck and that guy detonated the V-bid. Yeah, so they're, they're just like that's hit pay dirt echo. with who they're about to take out of this world. Yeah. So, yeah, I'd say they're a little preoccupied. Yeah. And rightfully so. So I just love that damn scene. The one thing I, with the gunfight scenes, I, I don't understand how... Lone Survivor was able to make it feel so real. It was like, tap, snap, yeah. crack. And then he would get hit in the hand, and then his finger would be missing, and he's like, fuck. It was, yeah, it was very, like, fuck. visceral and gritty. Like, Dude, Lone Survivor did Lone, the best job. Lone Survivor is still the GOAT when it comes to gunfights. I don't even know how they did it. And this one is like Lone Survivor. They got an actor from Lone Survivor in it. They had the new guy in it. But the scenes in Lone Survivor, I think it's the sounds. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of when we reviewed, um, uh, what's the one with the bank robber scene? A uh, Heat. We reviewed Heat, and they use the actual gunfire as the sound, so it makes it seem really real. That's because the sounds are real. Huh. So I think a lot of comes down to how they make the sounds and the snaps and the hisses in post-production. Interesting. Because Lone Survivor, dude, it was like... Sh- Sap, yeah. 
crack. Yeah. Uh, uh, and then it's just him with his finger bleeding. He's like, I'm like, oh my gosh, dude. <laughs> That's so insane, and unfortunately, I wish that this brought the same punch in the gunfights, but, uh, you know, that's a, high, that's a high bar. Yeah, it is, true. It just looks like a bunch of blocks right. of C4. Like three minutes. Let's looks go. like it's on move, something, move, though. Move, move, move. Hold, hold. Move, move. All units, we have a three-minute burning fuse. Keep that 50K lock on North Road. Copy that. Kyle, we are on your... So on that one, it, it almost looked like it was a block of C4 on something. It looked like a on a which, C4. Maybe, I don't know. But which, that, that much C4 in that block, I mean, that would have destroyed, like, that whole team. It would have done a lot. But the fact that it, if it was on something, because you got to think about what C4 is useful for and what other explosives are. So C4 is a cutting charge. So it's a very sharp charge that can slice through steel things like that and generally when you have demo you think of cutting and pushing charges mm -hmm. a pushing charge is something that is gonna like destroy a wide area where c4 is going to destroy a pinpoint target um so if I, I couldn't really tell if it was on something i don't know what it would be on but maybe they're using the c4 to detonate a different type of pushing charge or you know you can use like you know, other things like water impulse charges mm -hmm. and you detonate, you know, the water bag and it pushes things out and that'll destroy a wider range or wider area. So I don't know exactly what he's using. I've but, never seen a three minute charge either. Yeah, those are something we never use them, but I'd seen them. And I want to say you could get, don't quote me, I, I think you could get a three minute and a 10 minute. And so generally if you have time fuse, a three minute time fuse is going to be pretty long. long but you saw shit. what he pulled out was short. Yeah. And so it's a slower burning timed fuse. It's something that you can order through the army channels. Um, it just saves space and you're not having to w measure them out. You just get it and just use it's it. It's already set. Yeah. There you go. Which the, the CRIF used to use a lot with the, um, those, the, we had the same thing and it was like, once you crack it, it's a set time. It was like 60 seconds or something. Mm -hmm. So that way you can go up, yep. plant your door breach, hit it and then everybody leave and then flow back in. Exactly. Instead of having to plan it, run your time fuse yep. all the way back to safety and then hit it, get an immediate charge and then flow in. Yeah. The the time the um, timed initiation was pretty convenient yeah. and it's pretty badass. And like with everything else, you're carrying less equipment, that's mm -hmm. less weight. Yeah, it's and it's less like to pre deal with. pre bundled yeah. and all that stuff. So you can carry multiple. Yep. Cause the those ones were like thin wire, so you could wrap it and then make it like a bundle like this. As yeah. to where the time fuse was so thick, yep. and you can't wrap it on itself, you have to do like loops. Yeah. So then you need almost like a backpack. Exactly. Yeah. To to carry it. So. I, I just thought that was cool how yeah. like clearly you know who's got it in their pack. Mm -hmm. You just pull it off his back, light it, and get out of there. Yeah, it's pretty sweet. I think I get it now. I think I get why it's not feeling realistic. And having been shot at and having even watched Lone Survivor, it's exactly that. There's no close shots. It's ta ta ta, bam bam bam, ta 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 ta, bam 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 bam, and that's not realistic. No misses. There's no misses. There's no the the hiss from a round getting shot at you close is deafening. It's terrifying. It's horrible. And all that is part of the experience. Someone shooting a rifle at you yeah. isn't like pow, 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 either miss or a hit. It's not like nothing or ping, 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 I got hit. Yeah. It's snap, whop, up, crack, yeah. poof, poof. Like you feel the intensity of the misses just as much as you do the hits. Like it's, it's all of it is happening in the snaps and hisses next to you. You start to be able to identify how close things are were to you in the directions they're traveling based on the the disgusting noise that they make when it's passing by you 
And Lone Survivor did a really good job mm -hmm. of that. Every scene was you're either getting hit or you could feel how close it was. The snap, yeah. crack. And you, you hear the, the wood next to him getting hit. You hear the ground getting hit. So it's the effect of all the bullets. As to where in this, it's like crack, crack, crack. Crack, crack, crack. Yeah. Poo, poo, poo. And so you miss, I don't know, you just miss the, the well, realness of this, it. This, it's almost, and it's, it's almost like the difference between shooting live rounds and blanks. Because mm -hmm. with a blank, like you hear that pop, 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 but you don't hear anything else. Like right, saying. exactly. So it's almost like in Lone Survivor, they actually added that actual sound in, yep. where this one, it was just actors pop, shooting pop, pop. blanks. Pop, pop, pop. Yeah. Exactly it. This one's blanks, and it just takes away from the realism that I think if they would have just added that in, which I understand somebody that's never been in combat or it doesn't know, like, like, oh, what does it matter? It's pop, pop, pop. You're getting shot. This sucks. I was like, no, it's so much more than that because those misses are just as terrifying. They're horrifying. You know, it's like, you, it's not just pop, 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 you missed. It's, whoa. whoa. Right. That. So which way know? do I go? Like, now I got to get away from that and I want to not get hit. And it just brings the intensity through the roof. The other thing I have to say about the scene is they have the dude in the gunner seat, and I get it's a skeleton crew, but being in a 50 cal seat without a driver is a terrifying situation. You need to be able to maneuver. So we always had our drivers, like in the Mat Vs, they stayed in the Mat V, and we had infantrymen most of the time. Sometimes it was a GB, but if you're a driver, you don't get out of that car. And that's one of the issues, again, that having a skeleton crew is they don't have enough people to always have someone in mm -hmm. the driver's seat. So, like, if I'm in the gunner seat, I don't want to just be in a dead car shooting my gun. You're, like, the, you're the biggest target out yeah. there. Like, everybody wants you to stop. Right. So you're a magnet for everybody. Exactly. I want that vehicle to be able to move so I could be, and I don't need comms. I could just yell at my driver, drive, 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 so he could position or even just make me a moving target yeah. instead of a stationary target for an rpg at 50 meters away to just shoot me in the yep. face Mm. What a Dude. G, son. So for me, like, the music in this movie, mm -hmm. for me, that scene, when that song starts out, it reminds me of, like, a child's, like, music box with a little yeah. ballerina that spins, but then it gets, like, this ominous tone behind it, and I feel like... It's like unconventional, but sets the tone perfect. It's beautiful for it's this amazing. dude. Amazing, yeah. His emotionless, dead face. Yeah, and yeah. And he's, he's almost just letting him have the time. Yeah. You know, he's just like, he's like, I know you think that you're gonna, you might get it out. I know yeah. you, think you might. Doge. Doge. A beautiful scene. That is awesome. Beautiful. And, that, yeah. and for the record, this whole movie is paying tribute to all the interpreters and all the people that supported the U.S. And then when we had the pull out and then the Taliban retook the country, this was all based on real world events. So this isn't like one story. It's a culmination of many stories right, Yeah. to tell the, the, the heroism and the story of the heroism of so many Afghans that risked their lives for U.S. soldiers. And we have one and his name's Fazli and he risked his life a ton of times for us and he was a total before he was an interpreter, he was a first sergeant in the commandos in special forces and then became an interpreter. So just so you guys don't think that this is like outlandish, this happens all the time. Yeah, Almost, you'd have a guy that's got training. Yes. He was in gunfights with I got videos of Fosley shooting at with me and we were good after it together. The picture on my Instagram, if you go to my Instagram, the one where I'm shooting over the hood, I was shooting at... Uh, Com cam took that. Oh, your most famous picture. Yeah, the one with the yeah. people were like, oh, it's bolts locked to the rear. It's not real. I'm like, yeah, do you see the round flying out? I was shooting you. <laughs> so Fosley's in that picture. It's Tom and Fosley behind me. That's awesome. So our interpreter Fosley is a total G, man. And he did heroic all the time. He always had her back. And I'm happy to report he's in America. Hell yeah. So it worked. This works. So this movie is not just based on, it's not just fake it's just 
they took a story and kind of made their own, but it's really just the culmination of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stories. Yeah. And our story, personally, Fosley. And he's in America. Yeah. <laughs> Talked to him on Instagram not too long ago. Nice. You think I have a choice? There is no f choice. I am going to get that man and his family out of the position that we put him in. And of that I have no doubt. And you're going to help me, Colonel. Pay your debts. All right. That's the type of speech that would only hit in SF. Yeah. Regular yeah. Army, that Colonel would be like, ha ha. <laughs> I love that scene for two reasons. One of them is his cadence when he's talking. Beautiful. Like that is a, a broken man that is absolutely resolute about what he's saying. Mm -hmm. Like no matter what is coming out of his mouth, that about to happen. That's just brilliant <laughs> acting. Yeah, it was. And like just his complete demeanor and everything, like I feel that. His like, pauses? Yeah. Like he paused for so long at one point, it's like it it said more than words. Yeah. I was and, like this guy, like, nobody said a word because it's just, like, you can't at that moment. The other part that I love about this scene was he walked in there, and this colonel thought that that conversation was going to go a complete <laughs> yeah, different he way. Did. He was like, have a seat. And he's like, no, no, no. No, no. I'd rather stand. And then completely took the room. <laughs> but it's like, this guy, like, honestly, what can he say? Yeah. He's completely 100% right. And even his non-acting as Johnny Lee Miller as the colonel it was phenomenal yeah it was, it was awesome. very like i'm still in charge but i understand you and yeah. yes you saved my life it, it wasn't anything more than it needed to be it, it, there was this dominance or not dominance but a, a assertiveness on jake gyllenhaal's character and this also like uh i don't i don't know how to i don't know he was like the the other guy the colonel was kind of submissive right there but it was also perfect yeah, because it's, it's submissive it's knowing that he's really in charge. Like, Jake Jones has no authority whatsoever. Right. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, I, I'm submitting to you only because of honor. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. of you saving my life eight years it ago. Was honor and mutual respect. Honor and mutual respect is the only reason I'm being submissive to you right now. Yeah. It's like just mutual respect. He's it's not like, being really disrespectful. He's just being kind of assertive. And this guy is also recognizing the respect. Yeah, and, and, and knowing that he's Jake like, Gyllenhaal yeah. also made a very big and bold thing. It says, "This is my last request." He said, "Pay your debts." And when yeah. he said, "Pay your debts," he's telling that colonel, "That's not. I'm never going to come to you and ask for anything again. You'll be clear, so there won't be some kind of, hey man, I really need this career advancement. I really need this school. I really need mm -hmm. this. I really need that. You owe me." No, he's saying. Everything that could come in the future of you helping my career, I'm asking for it right now, and we're even. You don't ever have to do that stuff again. Mm -hmm. And in the SF world, you would ab you would abide by that to the best of your ability. So if, if you come in and say, dude, I'm pulling my cards. I want my chips. You, okay, I'm going to do that, but we're clear after that. Yeah. So if there's ever mm -hmm. two guys and you're competing with one, you would have been – above this one because you had some debt in your pocket you don't have that anymore we're clear so in the future you gave it up yep. and he's saying in this meeting that like i'm willing to give it all up you know any favors you could possibly do for me which is astronomical given his position for this yep. which is bananas to Love even think scene, about man. because it's like you're giving up your career and all the things i could help you with achieving in your career for an afghan interpreter after you've already been home and moved on from that war. How many Afghans do we just completely forget about once we leave that place? But not this one. Not today. Not after what he did. Mm -hmm. Happy. You can take your money back. Oh, no, I'm definitely not fucking happy. <laughs> I don't want the money. I want you to honor the deal. I hear you have an impressive team. Now I need you to back yourself. If you can find... Ahmed and his family. Call us with the location. We'll come in, airlift you out, get you back to base, put you on the next transport home. Done. So to me, this is... The, I just wanted to mention this guy. I'm kind of stuck on proving myself right when it comes to terminal list. 
<laughs> yeah. This episode. <laughs> every episode has to have a terminal list. Every reference. episode, because this is what dialogue that builds a story and builds a plot looks like. This dialogue between two people moved at 100 miles an hour within 30 seconds. <laughs> we got from point A explaining an asinine amount of information why he paid $150,000, why he's still not going to get what he wants, how he could wait three days and he's not being a total j and why he's going to go in by himself yep. within 30 seconds. <laughs> that is what plot development looks like. That is what character development looks like. And that's how you do it. I just That was level 10 for me on how to write dialogue for SF guys. That was good. That was good. You always have to bring terminal lists in it. That's whatever. But it was a good scene. <laughs> My favorite part, I just love their timing when he was like, if you're not happy, you could take the 10 grand back. And he's like immediately like, oh, no, I'm definitely not happy. Yeah, love it. It's beautiful. And But like he wasn't overdoing it or anything. No. Like his face didn't really change. He refinanced his or house. the world. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, he refinanced his house. For 150 Potentially G's. might not ever go home. Yeah. Like put everything on the line. And you're telling him that all that support he paid for is no longer there because somebody else bought it? I'm trying to finish my mission. Don't tell me you're going to give me my money back because then I just wouldn't have started any of this to begin with. You've done it like this from the beginning. Yeah. Jake Gyllenhaal was pissed. Jake Gyllenhaal could act, bro. All right, so I just want to compare the actors that we've had now because you guys didn't realize, but we're kind of becoming like these... It's, it's a ridiculous realm, but <laughs> subject matter experts on military movies because we've watched <laughs> so many and reviewed so many. That we have this absolutely A-list level of acting when it comes from Jake Gyllenhaal with Jarhead and now uh, this movie. And then we have um, 13 Hours with John Kaczynski, who I think is absolutely on the same level as Jake mm -hmm. Gyllenhaal when it comes to their performance. And then I think you have not quite as good as them, but really high up with Mark Wahlberg in uh, Lone Survivor. Lone Survivor. Yeah. So it's like we we just put this up on a pedestal. Like these these guys are just nailing it. And if you don't meet this level of performance, right. you're not playing in the same game. Maybe if we get a couple more of these movies and we'll make like this super SF movie. Oh, and just have, have all of them all there of them with like did. the production team from Lone Survivor mixed with the music and the cinematography from this movie. Yes. And those actors together and it'll just be the ultimate the, end all be all special operations movie. The end all be all. At, at this point, would, <laughs> would Chris Pratt be invited? <laughs> <laughs> I think if we did, we might have to leave. Uh, we might have to leave our own production. Chris, Chris Pratt and Jake, or what's his name, Jack Carr, Jack <laughs> are the main people. Would you? So, if you're gonna do a Formula One race, would you invite NASCAR drivers? <laughs> oh Jesus! I mean, there, there's gonna be a fight for sure. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> go, 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 go. See, they tried to edit the, but it doesn't have the intensity. It's like they're playing paintball. So I see, for first off, I see what you're saying on that. And the other thing, it's almost like they are doing paintball or airsoft because with the rifles in this movie, there's zero recoil. With every mm -hmm. shooting scene in this movie, there's zero recoil. It's almost just like point and add some sound effects. Yeah. Where I feel like Lone Survivor, you you felt like everything was real. They there was showed, recoil, they there's showed bolts the, moving. Yeah, the bolts moving, the rounds flying yeah. out. Everything was so real. It was takao, 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 takao. Yeah, this movie did it wasn't such a bop, 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 right. bop, bop. This movie did a great job on everything except, except for that. the actual shooting. Yeah, which makes all the difference in a shooting scene. Just do those little extra steps to to just watch Lone Survivor. <laughs> just watch Lone Survivor. Don't watch Terminal List. Don't watch. Do less Terminal List, more Lone Survivor. And watch Lone Survivor, and then take notes, and then add that to every shooting scene to ever do a shooting movie again. And we're there. You've made it to ten. You know, it's the they were like kata kata. The bolt going through the rounds yeah. flying out. The running out of ammo at the right time. Sean running around, be like, hey, what's up, man? Lone Survivor, man. Lone Survivor. Kata 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 kapow. But. 
This scene, I, I really appreciate the bounding movements on this mm. scene. Like, nobody was moving without appropriate cover. Somebody was always providing cover fire. Mm -hmm. So you're shooting, trying to keep everybody's heads down while your element can move. They're communicating beautifully. Every time somebody gets up and sets, you saw the one guy, uh, Ahmed, was like, all right, come on. Not with his shooting hand, because that would have been a huge tactical mistake, right? But he's like, all right, come on, and continues firing. And then he's the other guy, Jake Gyllenhaal, sets. And he's like, all right, now everybody else move. And you can see that bounding, which is beautiful. And for the record, guys, we watched some behind the scenes on making this exact scene. And I am shocked that Jake Gyllenhaal made it so realistic because there's nothing real about it when they're filming it. Oh, it was, It's yeah. literally like, run. Yeah, there was a guy shooting right, an airsoft run. gun at the wall, making yeah. this like splash of, of dust. And then he runs, and then Jake Gyllenhaal, it's just completely quiet. He runs. A bunch of weird people standing around. Yeah, and they're he's all just, just like, watching him, and he's like... <laughs> Which makes sense now, because when you see the after effect, he's just like... Phew, and then they add this sound. Do, 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 and the yeah. gun doesn't move or anything. And it's like, maybe if you added some of that in the scene, like even just a... You have all this money. You can't have a gun that recoils yeah. and like makes him feel like he's in the moment because you could tell like he's just sitting up and he's just like this. Bro, when rounds are coming at you, you are not just popping your head up just, hey, 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 hey. <laughs> you're trying to be the smallest target you can. You're, you're scared. You're hiding behind the wall. You're trying to find your target and then shoot them and then get back down. Like... The, the rounds coming back changes the way you act, the way you feel, the way you curl up and try to be the smallest yeah. human being on the planet. That would have been awesome. Just have him shooting like sim rounds or like exactly. uh, airsoft rounds back at him. Exactly. He could have filled it up with sim rounds and his he would have had bolt. He would have felt, even as an actor, he would have having the uh, paint rounds. Sim rounds are frightening, right? They're, like they're you don't scary. want to get hit with Go up to Jake Gyllenhaal's feet and shoot some sim rounds and he'd be like, what? <laughs> One of the scenes, it was really funny because... Remember we talked about the boots he's wearing? They're the same boots I wore in Afghanistan. In one of the scenes in the after, they weren't going to show his boots. So what is he wearing? Tennis shoes. <laughs> like, maybe don't make everything so comfortable for the actor every chance you can. Yeah. Maybe just let him be in uniform and boots all day long instead of switching out to tennis shoes just because you're not going to see his feet. Well, there's another movie... I can't remember what it is now, but they did that where they did not let the actors be comfortable. Good. They had plates in, like they had real helmets, They're like everything. So they got to feel how it takes a toll on your body. Like yeah, you start how to your slow traps down. start to hurt after a while wearing the plate carrier. Yeah, like everything How your ears sucks. hurt after wearing Pelotors for 10 hours. Yeah, why you'd be walking around with one Pelotor in and one Pelotor hanging out, cocked out, because it's like yeah. you just want to break on that ear. Yeah, exactly. You're like feeling like you're going to get cauliflower ear in there <laughs> so it's like yeah it's like, make them suffer a little bit stop treating these little pampas <laughs> pompous <laughs> actors like they can't get a blister on their feet if they want to play the role then play the role man up i'm just saying but I, other than that it was a phenomenal great movie, movie. we're just nitpicking right <laughs> right well, i'm just right? having fun with it because <laughs> but it's a great movie i just watching the the behind the scenes i was like how does jake even do this it's so quiet and it's yeah. so fake Good for him to be even realistic at all. Imagine but, in your head, you're just like, pew, pew. Yeah, pew, it's pew, like, pew, pew. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably playing some like random ass song in his mind. He's like, staying alive, staying alive, ah, 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 staying alive, staying alive. <laughs> All right, guys, we uh, hope you enjoyed that episode of Beers and Breakdowns. Finally, Green Berets get a good movie. Uh, sorry, Chris, uh, what's his name? Christopher Pratt? No, Thor. Oh, Christopher Pratt? <laughs> no, Thor. Who's Thor? Hemsworth. Hemsworth. <laughs> Chris Hemsworth was one that played the played a Green Beret. That's it. Hemsworth. Hemsworth. Sorry, Chris Hemsworth. I'm but just so used to you talking about Chris Pratt. <laughs> no, I moved past. I've already proven my point. Oh, man. Today was the day that I'm done trying to prove my point. I made it. So, Chris Hemsworth. I'm sorry, okay. man, but you didn't do that movie for us. You didn't do that movie justice for us. We don't co-sign. I don't co-sign that for you. No, no, no. Yeah, so we don't co-sign that for you. I'm sorry. Jake Jones. 12 strong? No. 12 strong? Didn't get it. Mm -mm. You missed the mark, my guy. You're like a one-man team doing yeah, everything. Doing too much. Doing stupid <laughs> Riding horses into tanks. Yeah, fighting tanks fighting on tanks a horse. Fighting tanks on a horseback. With an M4. Like, Chris, Jesus. you did some 
than that. But for the first time, I co-signed the of Jake hey. Gyllenhaal. Jake Gyllenhaal freed the oppressed. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he did. So I say that we we finally got a win in at least in recent war movies. Uh, so thank you, Jake Gyllenhaal. We appreciate you. All right, guys. We'll see you on the next episode. Dude, Abel's going to have a field day with that one. That's going to be so much work. How long was it? 135.